Hey, did you forget you still need to take out the trash? Something? Yeah, I was trying to remind you to take out the trash. Did you forget? Hmm. Where would you like me to take the trash to? Here are some options. Take the trash out on a date, take it to the dumpster, take it to the junkyard, or would you like to try rephrasing your request? Are you kidding me? How about this? Get your butt out of this room, go take the trash to the dumpster, or I'll take your TV and throw it out too. Oh, thanks for the reminder, Mom. I'll go take out the trash now. It's like dealing with a video game character. Well, we're in the book of Ephesians. We've been just going section by section, and today we're going to talk about a section that talks about parenting. But before I get into that, if you didn't fill out the communication card information last weekend, would you please fill one out? We gave you a piece of paper when you came in today. You can also use the Sagebrush app. Just click on the top banner and fill out the information. There's also an opportunity uh, for you to make a spiritual decision there as well. And then I also want to say to all of our volunteers, all of our team members in the month of September. We always do a big VIP party. It is a blast. We have a special gift for all of our volunteers. There's a lip sync battle that the staff does against each other. I'm going to be sharing about the future plans of our church over the next three to five years. This is a night you don't want to miss. So make sure on your campus you find out. And you can find all that information right there on the Sagebrush app. Just go to events. All that information is there for you as well. All right, let's talk about parenting because I guarantee that some of you came in here today and you're having a bit, a bit of trouble with the kids, aren't you? Well, we'll have some encouragement because God had his fair share of trouble with his first kids, Adam and Eve. He pulled Adam and Eve aside in the Garden of Eden. He said, now listen, you two, understand something. We've got forbidden fruit. Adam said, we've got forbidden fruit. And God said, yeah, we've got forbidden fruit. And Adam said, no way. And God said, yes way. And Adam turned to Eve and said, did you know we had forbidden fruit? And Eve said, no, I didn't know we had forbidden fruit. And God said, we've got forbidden fruit. And so there's certain fruit that I just don't want you to touch. I don't want you to eat this particular fruit. Stay away from this fruit. And it wasn't but five minutes later that Adam and Eve was having a forbidden fruit break, right? So God came up to them and he said, listen, I don't understand this at all. Didn't I tell you not to eat? eat that fruit? They said, uh-huh. He said, then why did you do it? They said, I don't know. And so God's punishment was that Adam and Eve would have kids of their own. <laughs> Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about, right? You used to have more hair than you have right now because you had kids. That's what happened to you. And sometimes our kids rebel. We read all about in the Bible about children who rebel, don't we? We've got Adam and Eve, obviously. We've got Cain and Abel. Cain kills his brother Abel. And then you got uh, Ishmael and Isaac. They started a family feud that continues on to this day. There's a reason there's no peace in the Middle East, and it all goes back to Ishmael and, and to Isaac. Friends, you're going to have difficulties. You're going to have trouble. I, I've talked to so many different parents along the way. They say, pray for me. My son is doing this. My daughter is doing this. And then generally speaking, they end the conversation by saying, but we're holding on to the promise of Proverbs 22, 6. Now, you know Proverbs 22, 6, don't you? Let, let's look at it for a second. It says, train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he's old, he won't turn away from it. Now, what in the world does that verse mean? Well, as parents, our job is to look at the natural bent that that child has, their attitude, their, their abilities, their interests, their personality. Study that child and come alongside that child and help that child grow in their relationship with the Lord. And the Bible says when they're old, they will not depart from it. 
And so there's a lot of parents saying, you know what, my, my kids have rebelled. They no longer go to church. They don't even talk about Jesus anymore. It's a big issue. I, I, I pray for them all the time. But I know that eventually, because of Proverbs 22, 6, my child will return. I don't say this to bum you out, but you need to understand something about the book of Proverbs. The book of Proverbs is not about promises. These are not God's promises. These are principles. That's what the word Proverbs means. It means principles. The writer is trying to say under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, this is the way that it usually goes. Usually the child will one day return. But of course, there are those moments when the child never returns. And you pray and you pray and you pray for that child to come to their senses. And the child never comes to their senses. Listen, there's no, there's no rhyme or reason to parenting. Can we all be honest about that? Because in the Bible, there are godly people that have ungodly kids, and there's ungodly parents that have exceptionally godly children. There's no rhyme or reason to it. All you can do as a parent is do the very best that you can do and realize you're going to make some parenting mistakes along the way. There was a dad who got himself involved in the relationship of his daughter. She was engaged to be married to this guy. He wasn't excited about it at all, so he had her break off the engagement. Well, later he changed his mind, so he wrote the following note. He said, Dear Bubba, I've been unable to sleep since I broke off your engagement to my daughter. Will you forgive and forget? I was much too sensitive about your mohawk tattoo and your pierced nose. I now realize that motorcycles aren't really that dangerous, and I shouldn't have reacted the way I did to the fact that you never have held a job one time in your life. Sure, my daughter's only 18, wants to marry you instead of going to Harvard on a full scholarship, but after all, you can't learn everything about life from books. I sometimes forget how backwards I can be. I was wrong. I was a fool. I've now come to my senses. You have my full blessing to marry my daughter. Sincerely, your future father-in-law. P.S. Congrats on winning this week's lottery. <laughs> Ultimately, our kids will decide what direction they're going to go, and our job is to guide them the best we can. Well, there's this section of Scripture in Ephesians that's, a, that's a, an attempt. It's God's attempt to keep children and parents on the same page so that their home can truly be a home, sweet home, and, and, and not a, a battleground. There's a responsibility here for the child, and there's a responsibility for the parents as well. Let's look at the passage of Scripture. Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with the promise that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. So the passage starts right off here. It says, children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right, so you will enjoy long life on the earth. Now, why does it say that? It's because if you don't do that, your parents will probably kill you. That's why it says that right there. I'm just messing around. The home is supposed to be a place where children learn to respect, where they learn to honor those who God has placed in authority over them. So it's a parent's responsibility to make certain that their children learn to honor and respect those that God's placed in authority over them. Why? Because one day they're going to leave your home. One day they're going to have a teacher. One day they're going to have a boss. And if they can't learn to honor and respect those whom God has placed in authority over them, they're not going to have a very profitable life, are they? They're, they're going to have trouble along the way. You, you've probably been to a home. Or maybe you grew up in a home where there was lots of fighting and lots of terrible things that were going on. They, that it wasn't a home sweet home. It was a, it was a battleground. That, that's the kind of home I grew up in. Uh, my brother and my sister threw fits at my mom and dad. They cursed at them. They yelled at them. I, I can't even think about, you know, during a typical week when we'd have family dinners, that we'd ever have a family dinner where there wasn't a major fight that broke out because my, my brother or my sister would dishonor or disrespect my mom and my dad. And I remember sitting there as the youngest child, and I, I just couldn't figure out why they were rebelling against them. I couldn't understand why they were talking to them and treating them this way. I knew that everything that my parents did, they did for my benefit. 
They, they did it for all of our benefit. My parents loved each of us equally. And all they wanted for their life it was to see us succeed in life. Let, let me talk to the teenagers, and if there's any kids in the room, let me just talk to you for a second. Contrary to popular opinion, your parents aren't out to get you. Do you understand that? Some of you are going to run after this service and get the kids plant and have them sit for the next service so they can hear this, right? But your parents aren't out to get you. They aren't. They are for you in every single way, and they want to help you and lead you and guide you into the best life possible. So you can help with this. You can make the home a happy place, and I'm going to tell you right now how to do it. Just be obedient to them. Whatever they ask you to do, because I know they're not going to ask you to do something that's ungodly. Whatever they ask you to do, in the words of Nike, just do it. That's it. It's not that hard. It's not that difficult. Hey, take out the trash. Just do it. Empty out the dishwasher. Just do it. Put your sink, your, your bowl that you put in the sink that you dirtied into the dishwasher, right? Clean your room. Just do it. Go pick up dog poop. Just do it. And do it the first time. Don't do it with the roll of the eyes. Don't do it with a heavy sigh like you're looking for an oxygen tank because you need extra oxygen to get across the room. Just do it for them. You say, I don't want to do it. I don't want to do anything. Let me tell you something. Jesus always obeyed his parents. And the Bible verse says here that you do this as is fitting to the Lord. You don't do this for mom and dad. You do this for Jesus. And you say that you have a relationship with Jesus, then you do life like Jesus did it. And Jesus always obeyed Mary and Joseph. You say, well, of course he did. He was perfect. Yeah, but his parents weren't. And he still honored them. He still respected them. And he still obeyed them. So that's the child's responsibility, right? To honor their mother and father because everything will go well when a child is pliable and realizes that their parents love them and care about them. Obey them the first time. Now there's a responsibility here also for the parents. Let's look at that. The passage continues. Fathers... Do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Now, now this is a, a, a for both husband and wife. It's for both mom and dad, isn't it? Don't exasperate your child. Now, how in the world do parents exasperate their kids? Let me give you some ways you can raise a rebellious child. You ready? And you can mark down yourself how many of these you've done. First one is this. Insult them. That's a great way to raise a child who will rebel against you. Tell them they're no good. They'll never amount to anything. Uh, Pinpoint all their flaws. Throw as many zingers at them as you possibly can. Tell them that what they do is never good enough. Just put it on them every opportunity that you've got. And then pit them against their brother and their sister. Say things like, why can't you be more like him? Why can't you be more like her? And I promise you this, that child will absolutely hate you and bring hell to your home. They will rebel against you again and again and again. Because they're not receiving love from you. They're just receiving condemnation. They're just being discouraged at every single turn. Some parents are just ridiculously hard on their kids. And they need you to breathe life into them, to bring encouragement to them. Are you a discouraging parent? Do you have to always put them in their place and tell them every jot and tittle of everything that they've done wrong? Can you forgive an offense and not bring it up again? If you can't, you're going to raise a rebellious child and sold them. Let me give you another one. Ignore them. Just ignore your kids. (laughs) You were so excited to have them, weren't you? And now you're like, can you go somewhere? Can you go to your room? Can you go someplace else? So many parents, they don't have time for their kids anymore. They're so busy making a name for themselves and climbing the corporate ladder and trying to make a buck and get to the corner office and finish this project and do this over here. You want to raise a rebellious child? Don't go to their games. Don't go, don't go to their practices. Don't, don't help them coach the teams. Don't get involved in their life. Don't know who their friends are. Just, just ignore them. 
Show them that what's on the phone is more important than what's on their heart. Show them that what's on that TV set is more important than what's going on in their life. And I promise you this, your child will rebel against you. A little boy came up to his dad. His dad just come in from work. He was exhausted. It had been a hard day. He came in really late. Son was about eight years old. He walked up to his dad and he said, Dad, I've got a question for you. He said, what do you, what do you want, son? He said, Dad, I'd like to know how much you make an hour. The dad was taken off a little bit. He's like, well, which this kid think he is asking me how much I make per hour? I'm not going to tell you how much I make per hour. He said, please, Dad, how much do you make per hour? He said, I don't know, son. $50 an hour. The little boy said, can I borrow 25 The dad was angry. He said, what do you need $25 for? There's a reason that you ask me how much I make per hour so you could get money off of me to buy some toy, do some kind of selfish thing. You go up to your room right now and you think about what you've done. So a little eight-year-old boy goes up the steps and shuts his door, gets ready for bed. Dad sits in the front room watching TV, flipping through channels. He's getting madder and madder, thinking about what his son, who in the world does this kid think he is, asking me how much I make, then asking for money. But time went by, and the anger began to simmer down just a little bit. He thought to himself, you know, my son's never asked me for money before. And maybe he needed it. Maybe it's a school project. Maybe there was something special that he needed to get done. I, I didn't even give him a chance to even explain to me what he wanted the $25 for. So he felt bad. So he said, you know, I'm going to go talk to him. So he walked up the steps and opened up the door. And he said, son, are you awake? And the little boy said, yes, dad. He turned on the light and sat on the bed. He said, son, I'm, I'm sorry. I've had a hard day and I kind of took it out on you. Here's, a, here's $25. And the son, he just lit up. And under his pillow, he moved it. There was a bunch of bills and coins that were under there. And now the dad is mad again. He's like, why did you ask me for money when you already had money? And the little guy said, well, I didn't have enough, but now I do. He said, now I've got $50. Dad, can I buy an hour of your time? Because I'd like to spend some time with you. I would like to have a meal with you. Do you know your kids? Do you spend time engaging in conversation with them? Silly conversation, serious conversation. Do you know what's on their heart? Because here's the thing. They can replace you in an instant at your job. But you are irreplaceable as the husband or the wife or the mom or the dad of that child. Do you know who their friends are? Well, what's their favorite song right now on the radio? Do you know? What, what do they want to accomplish this year in school? Where are they struggling? What subject do they need the most help? What fills their little heart with anxiety and worry and fear? Don't you want to come alongside them? Don't you want to carry the burden with them? But you can't do that if you're not spending any time with them. You want to raise a rebellious child? Insult them. Ignore them. Let me give you another one. Be inconsistent with them. Say one thing and then do another. Just be inconsistent with them. Say that you are a follower of Jesus Christ and at the house never get around to actually following him. Say that you love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength and show that you love the stuff of the world more than you love Jesus at your house. Be inconsistent. Be a hypocrite. And they'll never take you and they'll never take your faith in Jesus seriously. Be inconsistent in showing love for one child more than another child. Play favorites with your kids. Because you connect with one child more than you do another child. You have better chemistry with one child than you do another child. And you will inflict wounds on your family that you'll never recover from. And that would happen with uh, Isaac favoring Esau over Jacob. And the, and the two brothers, they hated each other as a result. Well, the cycle continued. Remember, Jacob goes off, gets married several times, has several children. He favors Joseph over everybody else. But the brothers aren't mad at the dad for the favoritism. They're mad at Joseph. So they sell him into slavery. 
You want to raise a rebellious child? It's really easy to do. Just treat one differently than you do the other. Love one more than you love the other. And you will start a sibling rivalry that is on absolute steroids. Let me, let me give you the fourth one. Withhold consistent discipline. Never get on the same page with your spouse when it comes to discipline. And your children will divide and conquer you every single day time why don't parents discipline and and when they do why doesn't the discipline work you ever thought about that I mean how many times you say well that didn't work and that didn't work and that didn't work I want you to write this down this is so good rules without relationship lead to rebellion did you get that rules without relationship lead to rebellion. Here's what a lot of parents are doing. They're not building relationships with their kids. They don't know their kids. They're not spending time with their kids. They don't know what's on their kids' hearts. They don't read the Bible with their kids. They don't pray together with their kids. Their kids have their life. You have your life. A little bit they intersect, but for the most part, you don't know them and they don't know you. And then you come on as the mom or the dad, and you say, now listen, we've got certain rules in this family, and we expect you to abide by these rules. But you don't have the relationship. They don't love you. They don't care about you because you haven't loved them. You haven't loved them unconditionally. So rules without relationship lead to rebellion. You see, one of the things you got to figure out when you train up a child in the way he should go is you got to figure out how to fill up their love tank. How do you show that child love in the way in which God made them to receive love? And if you have that love tank going on and you have a close relationship with them and they know that you're for them, so much so that you're willing to do the hard thing in their life, even making them mad at you because they know in the long run they love you and they're trying, you're trying to guide them the right way. Rules without relationship lead to rebellion. So could it be that maybe your child doesn't feel loved by you? You say, well, I do everything I can to love my child. Well, are you loving them in their love language? Are you filling up their love bucket? And do they know that they know that they know that you are for them in every way? Because if they don't, they will see your rules as restrictive and they'll rebel against you every single time. Now, a lot of parents, you know what they do when it comes to discipline? They, they just kind of wash their hands of it and say, well, kids will be kids. Boys will be boys and girls will be girls. And, you know, just, you know just, I just do the best I can. That's all I'll do. And they don't have a plan. They don't have a strategy for raising that child up to help that child succeed. Now, the Bible says if that's you, there's two things that are true. One is this. It proves you don't love your kids. Proverbs 13, verse 24 says, if you refuse to discipline your son, it proves you don't love him. That seems pretty clear. If you won't discipline your children to say that was wrong, this is right, and this is how you make it right, it shows that you're participating in them ruining their life. And that's the second point. It shows I'm participating in their destruction. Proverbs 19, verse 18, discipline your children while they're young enough to learn. If you don't, you're helping them destroy themselves. And that's what will happen. They, they won't succeed in life because they've never learned to honor. They've never learned to respect. They've never learned to accept authority that's in their life. So the question is, is how do we become better disciplinarians? Okay, so listen, I've got three girls. They're all nuts. I'll just tell you that right now. And I did the best I could do, and that's all I could do. And you're going to do the best that you can do. And at the end of the day, that's all you can do as well. But these were the things, these were the principles that Christy and I tried to invoke in raising our three kids. We did not do it perfectly. We made a lot of parenting mistakes along the way. But this is the things that helped us and guided us to try to help our children as much as possible. So let's put them on the TV. You can take pictures of this stuff if you want. I hope this will be helpful to you. But the first thing is this. You've got to spell out the expectations and, and rules for children. That, that, what does that mean? It means you never discipline a child child for something they didn't even know was wrong. Like when a child says, well, I, I didn't even know. I, I didn't even know that was wrong. I didn't even know I couldn't do that. Well, then you haven't spelled out the expectation and the rule for the child. So how do you discipline someone for a rule that wasn't even on the books? So that's important that you spell out the expectations, rules for the child. Let me give you another one. Never discipline children for making childish mistakes. 
okay? Your child reaches across the table, and they knock over a glass of milk, and it pours all into your lap. You go off and start yelling at them because they're a klutz. Why would you do that? Have you ever spilled a glass? Did anybody yell at you for spilling the glass? Did you mean to spill the glass? Did you sit at the table and go, I'm going to spill every glass on this table. I'll tell you that right now. I'm the biggest clutch you'll ever see. Bam! Now bring me the discipline. No, there's not a kid who wants to spill a glass of milk on their lap or on their dad's lap or their mom's lap. Accidents happen. You don't discipline for childish mistakes. You also don't discipline for childish forgetfulness. There's going to be times you say, I want you to do this or I want you to do this, and they're not going to follow through. Why? Because there's not enough oxygen to their brain. Do you understand what I'm saying? They are forgetful. They're kids. Did you forget what it was to be a teenager? And all the things that you had going on in your list of all the things that you had to accomplish and all the things you had to do. Do you remember how difficult it was as a child? And all of a sudden you fall behind in a class and, and you're, you're anxious the whole time, but you don't tell anybody about it because you don't want anybody to think that you're a failure. Do you remember that? And then your parents, they give you a list of things they want you to do and you forget one. And boy, they just let you have it, don't they? A, a young man, teenager, came home. He forgot to put the clothes in the dryer oh his mom was mad as hot she chewed him up one side down the other if she was a preacher she'd be the best one ever she gave a sermon like never before she is putting it on him i mean pounding this poor kid he asked for a time out about halfway through the sermon he said mom when you go to church and you hear about parents talking about how their son is on drugs or how their daughter is now pregnant do you say, that's nothing. My kid forgets to put the clothes in the dryer. <laughs> There's some things that just aren't, they just need to be overlooked. Sometimes they forget to put their bicycle up. Sometimes they forget to move the clothes to the dryer. Big deal. Remind them, small offense, then move on with your life. Don't make small things big things. Let me give you another one. Never discipline out of anger. This was the hardest one for me. I have a short fuse, and I get angry really quickly. And, and for some reason, I'm going to tell you this, I always felt like my kids were a reflection of me. That's not true. My kids are a reflection of themselves. But I would feel embarrassed for their behavior because I felt like they were a reflection of me. No, they weren't. They were a reflection of themselves. And so they would do something, it would just set me off. You know when you've gone too far is when you're yelling or when you look in the eyes of your child and you see fear. Boy, I wish I could go back. You know what you should do? Walk away. When you're angry, when you're frustrated, when you're saying things and acting in ways that are scary and hurtful and harmful, walk away. Go into another room. Walk around the neighborhood. Jump in a pool if you got one and cool off. But when you see fear, you don't ever want to parent your child to have them be afraid of you. Let me give you the next one. Always go from the mildest form of discipline to the more severe forms. And this is what usually happens is we go to the nuclear option way too quick, don't we? Because we're upset, we're angry, they've done it again, they've pushed your nuclear button. So you say, all right, well, you pushed the nuke, so here comes the nuke. I'm about to blow up your world right here. And so you put it on them in such a big way because you're overreacting to a situation because you haven't calmed yourself down. Always go from the mildest form of discipline. I have three daughters. My youngest daughter, Cammie, is the tenderest heart. All I had to do is give her an eye. <laughs> and that was it game was over she took care of it we moved on it wasn't a big deal my oldest daughter i'd give her the evil eye she'd be like bring it <laughs> bring it right now and so there were more severe forms of discipline that had to come the way but always start here with the mildest thing to correct the behavior let me give you the next one don't use harmful words you're so stupid. You're so dumb. How many times I got to tell you? Oh, I can't believe you're my kid. You're such a loser. You'll never amount to anything. Do that and you'll raise a rebellious child. 
Let me give you the next one. Always follow up discipline with love and affection. Once you've accomplished what you set to accomplish, you hold them, you hug them, you explain why you did what you did. Always follow up with love and affection. Let them know again that you are for them in every way and that if they continue down this path, it's going to lead them to destruction and that you care more about them than anybody else does on the face of the earth. Be consistent. If you say you're going to do something, do it. Stop counting to 10. Now, you, hey, you, you, you stop that. I'm going to count to 10. One, two, three, four, five. I mean it. Six, seven, eight, nine, nine and a half, <laughs> nine and three quarters. I mean it. Nine and seven eighths. I'm almost there. No wonder they don't do what you ask them to do. If you say you're going to do something, then do it. If you say if you do something, this is what's going to happen, then make sure you follow up with that. Be consistent. That gives them parameters. And once they have parameters, they can have a blast running around the fences that you put up to protect them. Let me give you another one. If you ever make a discipline mistake, own it. You will make mistakes. You will blow it. And what will mean more to your kids than anything else is if you apologize for it. If you say, I went too far. That was bad. I blew it. Will you forgive me? Here's the goal of discipline. You ready? Because most of the time when we discipline, it's because our child has wounded somebody else. They've fractured a relationship with somebody else. Here's the goal of parenting. To get them to learn to own their stuff, to ask for forgiveness, and receive forgiveness. Can you imagine if your child can own their stuff and apologize and say, I'm sorry, will you forgive me? And then you forgive them, you are modeling something for them that's going to benefit them for the rest of their life because they're going to hurt people along the way. And if they never learn to own their stuff, they never learn to apologize and ask for forgiveness, their relationships down the way are going to be broken. And the relationship with you is going to be broken. The relationship with their brother and sister is going to be broken. And so once you've accomplished that, you know, if they say, you know, I really blew it there. I'm sorry. Will you forgive? That's it. There's nothing else to do. You don't need to ground them for a semester. You don't need to ground them for a month. You don't need to take anything away. You've accomplished what you set out to accomplish. You have restored the relationship. So it says this. It says, fathers, do not exasperate your children, right? But instead, instead, what should we do instead? Bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. You're supposed to lead them spiritually. And can I let you a little sec secret? That's not the church's job. It's not the government's job to raise your kids. It's not politicians' jobs to raise your kids. It's not the school's job to raise your kids. It's not the church's job to raise your kids. We'll aid you. We'll assist you. But you got to do this on, you know, you got to do what you got to do. I mean, think about this. You come once every four weeks, and that's if I'm lucky. So we see your kids 12 hours a year, and you think we're going to spiritually train them? But you're with them every single day. And the Bible says in Deuteronomy that you're supposed to talk about the things of the Lord when you get up and when you lie down. That you are to be the spiritual influencer, right? And so what do you do? You bring them to church. You talk about spiritual things. You take that Kids Planet stuff and that remix stuff that we give the teenagers. And you say, hey, what would you guys talk about? And hey, was there any homework? And you get on the Sagebrush app and you go under resources. And all the parent stuff is there for you to reinforce what we just tried to teach your kids. You don't have to come up with it yourself. It's all right there under resources. And then you start having spiritual conversations. And then you start talking about the difference that Jesus has made in your life. And you do that through every decision that you make. And then your kids start catching you reading the Bible. And praying. And not praying the same prayer. You know, dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your mom, dad, Jeff and Kim. Thank you for this day. Amen. Not that kind of prayer, right? Rub-a-dub-dub. Thanks for the grub. Yay, God. Let's eat. All right, let's go. No, 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 no. Not the same repetitious prayer. You actually have a personal relationship with Jesus. So you pray for your kids. You pray over your kids. And they hear different things that you're praying over them for each night. 
And you immerse them, cover them with Jesus, with prayer. Let me let you on a little secret. Your kids are going to forget 99% of what you tried to teach them. But they'll remember who you are. And who you live for. And what you live for. And they'll know, because they're little sinners and they're watching you everywhere you go. They'll know if you're a hypocrite. They'll know if you're a liar. They know how serious you take this stuff. And if you'll take it seriously and really have a relationship with Jesus, well, maybe it would become so attractive and so contagious that they'd want what you have because you're authentic. You're the real deal. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, oh, this stuff's hard. Parenting's so hard. I made so many mistakes. Lord, I don't want anybody to do the same dumb things I did. And we look at that list of how to discipline, and we say, oh, I've done that one. Oh, I should do this more. Oh, I messed that up. Lord, maybe we can have the conversation with our children. Hey, I blew it here. Maybe, Lord, what we needed to hear today was we just need to involve ourselves more in the relationship with our family. We need to put down the phone and turn off the TV and stop running around everywhere with full of activity and start getting to know each other's hearts. Or we get one shot. 18 summers. And then out the door they go, off to college. And then they start families of their own. Help us not to blow this one. Help us to do it well. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.